Uh, I would like to appreciate uh, all of you to come for our uh, uh, seminar and uh, um, uh, I'm honored to be in this uh, famous university. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. <coughs> uh, I would like to just mention that I'm also a member of uh, Aerospace Consortium. Uh, you see the members of this consortium um, uh, which is devoted to develop uh, the numerical uh, uh, methodology and techniques using program LS99. Some of you, I'm sure, know this program very well. Uh, for the purpose of high energy impact and for aerospace uh, um, uh, pro problems. This uh, methodology and this program was tested in the aftermath of Shuttle Columbia disaster by NASA Glenn Research Center and uh, in, in, in uh, success. And uh, myself, uh, I also uh, am an um, uh, uh, author of a number of uh, mat material uh, models uh, for this program. So uh, we uh, uh, use this for the purpose of development of a composite material, which is braided composite, and I would like to show you the experiment that you can see. It is this impact experiment, and I will um, pass around the sample of this material. Uh, the significance of that is that this material is uh, very light, and uh, 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 at this point has been uh, uh, selected for the new jet engine by GE, uh, which is called Gen X, to fly Dreamliner. So obviously, uh, any uh, work of that kind requires uh, to get appropriate uh, experimental data that uh, we uh, obtained and uh, develop the uh, appropriate material mo model and methodology that to simulate this behavior. So we can see two time instances, and uh, at the top there is a so-called virtual uh, experiment, which is numerical representation of the behavior both of the gelatin material, which is that yellow splashing uh, projectile, and the uh, braided composite that you will see in a moment in your hands. Um, the uh, important, of course, is to, to, to get the deformation of this material as close as possible as the time progresses, and we are talking about milliseconds, a uh, very uh, uh, fast um, uh, impact. So, uh, of course, we are using explicit finite element to, for, for that purpose. The important, of course, also is to get the failure. And you can see here the failure of this plus minus 60 uh, braided composite. Uh, for, for those of you who are material scientists, you know that plus minus 60 composite is so-called quasi-isotropic. So if you go through the homogenization process of such material, the damage would be typically obtained as a cross. And uh, we were able to, to get, using shell elements, which is effective element to run uh, simulations uh, with special methodology, we call it uh, braiding through the integration points, the so-called butterfly shape, which is exactly what is in the experiment. So not only we could get the deformation, not only we can get the threshold velocity, which is the moment that the fa failure happens, but also shape of the velocity. Now, having that correlated, we could then ask ourselves, OK, what would happen to our material if our architecture will change? So we changed the architecture, and we got the results uh, of different shape or different mode of failure. And that was uh, compared with later done experiment to prove that our model is correct. So the, what we have done uh, was to develop a tool. Uh, that tool was then transferred to uh, companies like GE, Honeywell, Williams, Rolls-Royce, and others, who each of them can then develop a particular product or, can, or, or, or component for the product uh, that would be used in uh, their um, jet engines. Now, the uh, um, important is uh, that uh, every jet engine uh, has to um, uh, pro uh, produce a, a special test. This test is called laid out test. And uh, basically, you can see the example done by Rolls Royce, uh, where uh, one of the blades uh, 
taller than me uh, at the maximum RPM is explosively removed during uh, the uh, run, and you will see. Um, this, is, this experiment is required by FAA for a, a, a certification. Now, the cost of this experiment, this is it, this is, uh, is $20 million. So you can imagine that um, no matter if you use high-speed cameras or, um, uh, or, or look into this, uh, this is not something that a company would like to repeat again and again. Now, if you are experimentalist, of course, and you have only one data point, even if this is good data point, you feel kind of unsure about your results. So either FAA or the, the company is not sure if that, these results are really certain. And imagine what will happen if the airplane crashes later on and uh, because of the jet, jet engine failure. Okay? So uh, both uh, jet engine companies and FAA uh, gives us a lot of money, which we like, uh, to develop this material model. Uh, so they can uh, do the whole blade out test numerically to build the confidence uh, that their design is uh, going to work. So um, you know now with that tool we can develop uh, with, with the power of today computers, with parallel computing, we can run uh, the simulation and we can predict if particular um, uh, design will work or not. And the same thing can be done by those companies. Well, as an effect, we can see this material that, that um, you have in, or you had in your hands is here. This is so-called containment. This is the material that is pretty large. You know, it is one of the largest, or the largest part of the jet engine. Therefore, by replacing the typical steel cylinder by this composite cylinder, the jet engine by GE gained 30 percent of its weight. So this is very significant gain for aerospace companies because now they, they can compete um, on the global market because their jet engine will basically uh, uh, burn less fuel, will be more efficient, will be lighter, and therefore this uh, extra weight can be used for cargo instead of uh, just dead weight flying through this airplane. But if something is good, of course, the, the, there will be other products that will, is going to be used. Right now, helicopter um, companies are trying to use this material for shaft uh, of their helicopter um, engines. But let's come back to the topic that uh, we are here. Uh, I, I just wanted you to, to, to know that this is the same methodology that we use for uh, in, uh, analyzing aftermath of Shuttle Columbia or development of this material. This is not something out of the blue. It's really a, a very standardized technique that, uh, that an engineer, in fact, or graduate student can sit down and very quickly repeat. So if you would be interested to do it, uh, I'll be happy to help. Uh, the, uh, coming back to the Russian Investigation Committee, these are those two statements that motivated this particular work. So I'm going to focus on the uh, fact of uh, 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 what would happen if the airplane will hit the uh, 30, 40 centimeters burge? Now, uh, we have to understand that the plane that we are talking about is 110 tons airplane. The, each wing is about 20 meters in length. Um, and the length of the airplane is about 50 meters. So this is pretty sizable. In fact, if you remember uh, Boeing 727, uh, this is exactly a, a copy because Russian Tupolev 154 um, was um, copied, let's say, from uh, based on the Boeing 727. Um, if we uh, look into the, uh, those satellite pictures, uh, this is the location of the village. This is the trajectory of the airplane um, in the last seconds before the crash. This is the path that this uh, airplane is supposed to fly if that plane could land at the airstrip. For some reason, we, we don't know why, the uh, um, tower, uh, control tower um, explained again and again that he's on path and on, uh, on right gliding 
path, but it was 50 meters away from that uh, correct path. So even if, if it would not crash, it would not be able to land, basically, because it would be off uh, of the airstrip. Um, the, uh, if this is the location of the verge, the uh, fragment 6.5 meters, which is one third of the wing, of, the, of this uh, left wing of this airplane was found about 110 meters away from the birch. So that was the uh, 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 evidence. The interesting is that the birch is on the left side, so you, you are talking about left wing, but the wing, the wing itself was found on the right side of the center of mass path of this airplane. Uh, something has happened in this particular location, it's called TAF, so TAF 38, because the plane that was flying straight suddenly changed rapidly its direction. And at the point of FMS, uh, which is about 40 meters, uh, 30, 40 meters above the ground, uh, the airplane lost all the electricity and all the recorders stopped recording. This is the data that, that we are aware of. It. Um, the uh, Russian Investigating Committee, based on the fact that they found the, per the birch tree cut in half about six meters above the ground, they assumed that the plane cut with the left wing. And so this is the trajectory that this red dotted uh, dashed line uh, is uh, described by the Russian Investigating Committee. So what we can see that the, if this is six meters, somewhere here it must be about two meters, and the plane uh, is at 14 um, degrees pitch. So at that location, the tail of the, uh, of the uh, airplane would have to uh, already go on the ground, or below the ground, in fact, if you are precise. And because the uh, wheels were out, it should run on the wheels. Um, of course, also, if this is the six meters um, away from the, from the center of mass, so you can see that that uh, whole path should be, if the plane is really so low, should be shaved, right? All this vegetation should be shaved by the wings of the airplane. Now, uh, this is uh, soon after the uh, crash, and we see that all the vegetation is okay. So uh, that cannot be explained how the plane can fly so low and somehow not damage any of the vegetation after the purge. Um, what happened here, you know, we know again as engineers that uh, if there's a change of velocity vector, then that means there's acceleration. The time between this uh, green line and blue uh, and white line is one second. We are talking about 80 meters per second flying speed of this airplane. So within that frac uh, fraction of the second, we go from the velocity down to velocity up. Therefore, we should have acceleration. If you calculate this acceleration, it would be about 6 to 8 G. So, well, uh, I can tell you that even F-16 airplane cannot get this type of uh, acceleration, especially to going up, especially without one third of the wing. So that is questionable. But uh, moreover, this plane is not flying continuously, but is for some reason uh, stopping its climb and then going up again. So again, we should experience another 6 to 8 G uh, acceleration in the next step. Now, at this moment, uh, this moment FMS, um, the plane disintegrates, OK? No electricity airplane disintegrates. What uh, in the Russian uh, uh, report is said, the airplane has to turn around like that and crash upside down. Now, now we can find out why they had to lift the airplane up. Because if it, uh, the, the rest of the, of the wing is still uh, 20 minus 6, is still 14 meters, right? So you need enough clearance to make that rotation, otherwise, if you just go on the lower altitude, it, it will not be possible. So they knew that, they assumed that, that, that this is the one data point. They knew that they wanted to rotate 180 degrees. So somehow they had to go from that to that altitude. 
Now the black line, the black curve, this one, was measured by Tufts. The Tufts is one of the piece of equipment that airplane is equipped for, and it measures barometric pressure, which is basically altitude above the uh, runway. Uh, of course, you can see that this, this curve is very uh, smooth. It's not rapid. It doesn't change anything in terms of altitude, which makes more sense because you have 110 or 80 tons in this particular case airplane um, because it was not fully loaded. Uh, and and uh, it was trying to go around. It means it was climbing. In fact, what pilots wanted to go around it's, it means not landing. And something happens. And here, no electricity, and of course, it's going down and crashes to the ground. So this is what we know. Now, of course, we may ask, okay, why that project, uh, trajectory that was measured by Tufts was uh, not used in the report? Well, I cannot answer that question. Um, I, uh, I understand that the uh, Russian said, well, it was American device, so must be bad, and uh, therefore we uh, cannot use it. Okay. So. Uh, Again, if we look at the, uh, this is the picture from April 2010, and this is from June 2010, satellite pictures. You can see, again, this vegetation. This is the path of the airplane. So all of these trees sh should be, not there, should be shaved out, okay? But no, they are in good shape. They, they are growing here. And, and, but something happened at this location. This is so-called task 38 from where the, the rapid change has happened. We don't know what has happened. We know that was an important moment because uh, from the April to June, we can see that Russians removed all the vegetations in this area, put new soil in this, in this area, completely um, uh, restructure the, 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 this particular uh, area, although it was not the trees here were not removed. So, you know, they said, oh, we had to remove those trees because they caused the accident of this airplane. Then you ask, okay, so why didn't you remove those air, uh, um, trees which are even closer and taller than anything that was here? So, um, we don't know why they uh, not only um, removed all the brushes and trees, burned all the grass, which is ev evident, uh, as evidence you can see here, and cover this with a new soil, that is a, a question that I cannot answer. So uh, what my objective was to, as I said, take a, a information that is available and to put together a model of the airplane and a birch, put the material properties for each of the material used in this impact of two objects and see what happens. I'm not going to spend time on, on par par uh, particular parameters. I just wanted to tell you that to build confidence, we use two um, material models, so mathematical description of the behavior of, uh, of uh, birch and aluminum. One is a so-called generic model, which is elastic, cylindrically orthotropic, uh, with a maximum strain criterion as a failure. And the other was a uh, used material 143 from uh, LS Dyna, which was specially developed by uh, Federal Highway Administration for the tree. Um, this uh, model uh, is, is very accurate. It's also worth to note that the tree or, or wood uh, is very sensitive to the moisture content. So between the uh, zero moisture content and 25% <coughs> moisture content, the tree or wood can uh, change its strength by five times, can lose, can lose uh, 80 percent of the, of the strength. To be conservative, I assume that my wood is dry, okay? So I, I try to be conservative in my calculations. Of course, if the tree is uh, wet, it's also more flexible, it's not as brittle and not, uh, not as stiff. The wood is also strain rate dependent, it means the the uh, faster you apply load, the, the higher the maximum load is. So this material 143 was designed like that. Uh, it is strain rate dependent. It was um, verified by Federal Highway Administration using that bogging that you can see in, in the slide and um, uh, simulated with LS Dyna. 
What is interesting to know that the same um, model was also uh, used by a group of Bocceri um, that, uh, from California that used the experiment that you can see here. This is the Constellation airplane uh, um, experiment that, this, that destroyed basically at the beginning the wheels of the airplane, then with the right wing, the, this airplane cuts through two um, poles, wood poles, and the objective of this, of this experiment was to see how the fuel uh, spills during the crash. But accidentally, because they use those poles, it is also very good for me, because uh, without any discussion with this group, uh, I didn't know that they are doing this, uh, in simulation, they, they, in fact, they, their report was published in October in this year, in middle of October, it's available on the, on the web. And if you compare my work and his work, it's exactly the same, okay? They use the same model, the same methodology, so it means that, that without discussing the logic, engineering logic is obviously very similar. What is interesting about this airplane is that this airplane, in the old one, Constellation, it was much lighter than Tupolev. Not only lighter, um, about uh, um, two-thirds of the weight, but also very slow because it was propeller uh, uh, airplane. So the maximum speed that designers were designing this airplane was 600 kilometers per hour, when this maximum speed of jet engine, jet airplane, uh, Tupolev 154, or the same as Boeing 727, was 900 kilometers per hour. Now, any um, um, uh, engineer who is designing uh, airplanes know that uh, the wings are the most important part of the airplane, because the wings carry the weight uh, uh, of, the, of the airplane. So, um, the, it is important to know what is the maximum weight when you design uh, wings, and also, uh, you need to know what is the speed because you can have some turbulences and uh, the, the extra way, so-called dynamic loads that you have to add to static loads. So uh, this particular um, much lighter airplane had only two um, um, spars or beams along the length of the wing and in, instead of ribs had the trusses to make it as, as, lighter, as light as possible. But what is interesting that even though, um, by the way, the Tupolev 154 uh, has three beams and has a lot of ribs, and I will show it later. But even though this wing is much lighter and, and, uh, by, by any means, if you, if you look into this, uh, and the poles were the uh, dry, perfect wood uh, that, that was used not just a wild tree, uh, that it could be very weak. Uh, this uh, airplane cuts through those two poles without any problem as well. So, uh, this is exactly what was the shown in conclusion of the Bo uh, Bocceri and his group, and uh, 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 it is very useful because it verifies uh, a lot of my work. Now, uh, to characterize particular birch tree, we use also some experimental data. Uh, we use three-point bending, as you can see in the slide. And uh, you can see the two models that I uh, described at the beginning. The first one, the linear orthotropic, the generic one, is this green straight line. And the red line, which is covering exactly the experiment, is simulating that, that, that three-point bending, is uh, identical to experiment. So again, for, the, for those of you who understand strength of the material, you know that the, the uh, area under the curve is responsible for the energy, or for the work done to rupture the material. So if you compare this area to this area, you can um, see that the uh, linear model is too strong, okay? So the wood, if you use that model, would be too strong. But we used it anyway. Now, for the aluminum, we also use two models. The one which is so-called isotropic elastoplastic uh, with the hardening, with the maximum strain criterion, and with the data used from uh, the um, uh, Russian database. And the other uh, is uh, recently developed by uh, this consortium, the Johnson-Cook uh, model, 
that uh, was designed specially for aluminum use for the airplanes, for, uh, in, in airplane applications. So the Johnson Cook, again, you know, to, uh, is nonlinear, uh, is, is basically strain array dependent, is elast uh, some elastic, a lot of plasticity. So if you look into stress strain diagrams for the wood and for the aluminum on the right, you can see how all these uh, models look in comparison with each other. The straight in a, in a linear model, nonlinear bunch of curves because it is for different load speed would be different curve. Spe and generic for aluminum, which is that the, the top one, and Johnson Cook, which is smaller than generic that was uh, done using Russian database. Well, once we have the mod material models, we can design the uh, airplane. So we use uh, solid works uh, of the Tupolev 154 as the starting point, and we build the structure of the wing inside. Uh, and we focus on those three beams, spars, and we put numbers of those ribs. These are the cross sections of each spar in this airplane. Um, they are very strong, and, and, to, and to my colleagues uh, who are uh, designers in, of the airplanes, they explain to me that Russian designers are very good, but they, they don't trust too much the um, metallurgists. Okay? So they basically get the higher safety factor, and uh, typically an uh, airplane, American airplane, will not have that, this middle beam. Uh, because uh, in this country, you know, the, the, everything is more precise, so the state factor could be smaller, and therefore the structure could be lighter. But, uh, um, you know, uh, they, they have this additional uh, beam. Now, I would like also to point out that uh, I did not use those uh, stringers. Stringers are those uh, T-section uh, elements that are riveted to the skin of the of the um, uh, wing, and uh, I didn't want, I, I wanted to make my wing a little bit weaker, okay? So I use a little bit stronger, four times stronger uh, wood, but um, um, a little bit weaker uh, wing, because, you know, uh, I, I, when I present my work like uh, today, I want to make sure that I'm not making a, a simple error, that, that my conclusions are as uh, verifiable as good as possible. Well, uh, from that moment on, we have the model of the, of the uh, airplane. We just uh, mesh it. We have the mesh. And we use so-called parametric study, which means studies, which means for different parameters, which means different orientation of the plane with, with different uh, angles of attack and uh, pitch and uh, roll and so on. Uh, for different velocities because it may be if it is at that particular uh, orientation and flies horizontally or maybe it's at that uh, orientation and flies up, right? The, we, I don't know, okay? I don't know what it was, so I'm trying to cover it up with all the possibilities. Uh, in order to make sure that we didn't avoid anything, I had to ask for help of my friend, Professor Brown, who is an aerodynamics expert, and he calculated for this airplane the pressures, aerodynamic pressures, which we added to LS Dyna uh, before each crash. So these are simulations. Uh, of course, you know, each of the simulations, this is the uh, time in seconds, and so you can see uh, the red airplane with green, green um, wing, and this is the birch. This is the, of course, I didn't uh, assume any branches or leaves. Okay, these are not important. I assume that this is just a trunk of the tree. Um, if you look in closer, and uh, this is all using these generic models, you can see that the if, if leading edge is de destroyed of this, of this wing, but then the birch is cut by the first beam of, the, of, this, of this wing. Um, and what is interesting, after the cut, it falls down uh, in the direction of the flight of the airplane. This is dynamics. The same was, ha has happened in the experiment of uh, FAA with Constellation. Uh, and why I'm saying that? Uh, because 
for some reason, the, the tree in small lengths was broken 90 degrees to the flight of the airplane. We not, didn't fall along the direction of the airplane, but perpendicular. Uh, we change, of course, material models, and this is for this uh, uh, very fine mesh, and, and uh, Johnson could in material kind of 43. And this is when it goes horizontally. And uh, we were curious if it's possible that the bottom of the wing will be damaged but by the uh, piece of the, of the tree that is still uh, in ground. So if we look into this uh, from the bottom, uh, what has happened, the dynamics is very interesting to see that the inertia pushes that uh, tree down and, and basically that part is not even scratching the bottom of the surface of the wing. Um, it's, it's very, very exciting to see all the simulation. It takes a week or, or, or you know, a couple of good days to run each of the simulation. And of course, you know, you have graduate students, you ask them to do it in parallel and, and, and we can produce a lot of good results. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying just seeing the results and, and hard work is, uh, has to be credited to my graduate students. Um, and again, this is the, the most difficult, this is the most energy, fraction energy consumed case where it's going up at the same time, it's cutting through the street. But overall, we, we run hundreds of, of cases. Uh, I can conclude that no matter uh, for uh, what material model we use, for every analyzed uh, uh, scenario, for original nonlinear rate dependent material models, for fine or coarse mesh, always the results are the same. The airplane cuts through the tree. It has the damage of the front leading edge about 60 to 80 centimeters. The tree falls in the direction parallel to the direction of the airplane flight. And uh, without other damage, in my opinion, the plane could fly away uh, because the wing is intact. To be sure, of course, we consulted with the Boeing principal and structural engineer uh, to, you know, to verify if I'm not making any mistakes, and he confirmed that everything that I did in the simulation is correct. The interesting things recently found was the, this picture. The, one of the engineers in Poland uh, reconstructed the leading edge of this wing, and what he found that the leading edge is not damaged. So uh, that is quite shocking. You have a big hole beyond uh, the, 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 the wing, but the leading edge is not damaged. So that uh, situation uh, made my, all my work, all my simulation really uh, not necessary because we can conclude that the real, uh, because there is no visible damage uh, of the wing edge, and the real tree lays perpendicular to the airplane flight direction. And there is an extensive internal wing damage, including ripped off uh, rivets in, in that part of the wing. I can say that there was no impact between the birch tree and the left wing. And in fact, if you remember now that trajectory, the black trajectory that was measured from, by Tufts, that height was about five meters above the tree. Okay, so that confirmed basically that the measurement the, of the trajectory done by American sensor was correct and the airplane never um, hit the, this birch at six meters and most likely, and again, uh, some experts that, that are experts of the wood, Dr. Cieszewski from Georgia uh, University, uh, based on the, on, on the data that he, observation that he had, he said that this was rotten wood, basically, and uh, uh, if you just kick this tree, it will fall like that by itself. I said, how do you know that? Uh, well, the, the tree, which is healthy, when you break it, it loses the juices. You can see those juices. And in this particular tree, there was no juices dry, so uh, he even gave the name of the uh, fungus that developed in this tree, uh, and therefore why it was rotten. So I, I would, uh, you know, if you have any question about fungus, please call uh, Dr. Cieszewski and, and his friend in Canada. 
Well, so what I did next was to study uh, what would happen because we remember that the airplane supposed to turn around and crash. So uh, I developed the, uh, another model of the uh, 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 fuselage and it, uh, dropped this fuselage with, uh, with different velocities to the ground. And what I found that no matter how I did it, the ceiling, which is uh, touching first the floor, and some of the wall in the right or left would be crashed underneath of the floor, red floor. Um, if we look into the uh, Sandia National Lab of the same problem uh, from um, 10 years ago, they, they studied the behavior of the airplane if you put explosive inside. They, they, of course, they are charged with the uh, terrorist attacks, so they use the simulate different um, explosive, and you can see what happens when the pressure builds from the explosives. Basically, you rip the whole um, fuselage, and they open out, okay? If they open out. So you can imagine, if there was explosive in the fuselage, before the airplane crashed to the ground, you should see the walls and sling outside. If there was no crash, uh, explosives, then you should have everything intact, and if it crashed upside down, then ceiling or walls should be under the floor, right? That's, that's my expectations. Well, here it is. This is the picture of the uh, uh, airplane that uh, is taken in small x. This is the floor, this is the bottom of the airplane, this is one wall, this is another wall, and this is the ceiling. Well, the, you cannot get this type of uh, configuration of the airplane if you crash the airplane just into the ground. It has to open in the air, which makes sense because that confirms that FMS point, which is about 30, 40 meters, when all the recorders, all the electricity was gone. Okay? So something happened at that height, and obviously it couldn't crash at 30 meters above the ground. So I included also in my simulations the explosives, and indeed, if you have explosive, it opens uh, more like in the uh, is, is uh, resembling the picture of the real uh, you know wreckage of the airplane than the one that I simulated before without any explosives. Pro, uh, professor, uh, one of the professors from Warsaw Technical University, he received part of this airplane, this is the part of the wing, and he's expert of the um, uh, aluminum, and what he noticed that the, this part, which is shiny outside, is black inside. She, he also noticed that rivets, and each rivet um, can open it at a force of three, 100 kilograms, and so many, many rivets, and this is a very small piece of the airplane. This is like you can have it in two hands. And, and, and the deformation that is produced in this particular part is under pressure from inside out. You can see these lines that, that it was pressurized and then ripped off from the rest of the airplane along the fractured surfaces. He claims that this is a proof that there was an uh, uh, explosive, that this is explosive damage of this, uh, of this, and this is part of the wing, by the way. So, um, there's a lot of information going on. There's a lot of professors who are working on this topic right now, and uh, we need that because each of them has different area of expertise. And fortunately, there was a conference in, in uh, uh, April this year where those uh, um, uh, professors presented this work, they work, and we all agreed, no matter what we use, the uh, electric, electrical engineering professors look into uh, all the electric uh, wiring and behavior of the uh, generators and so on. The, I presented my work, uh, the Professor um, Obramski showed this particular piece of metal and so on. 
but we, conclusions were consistent. The airplane did not crash, and did not, was not destroyed because of the crash, but was destroyed because of the explosion inside. Well, I did another uh, simulation that would be my last. Uh, I assume, well, let's assume that, that, that the Russian uh, in, uh, report is correct. So the airplane as a one mass intact piece falls into the soft soil that was over there. Professor Robert Young, um, who is the geotechnical engineer, helped us to, to produce the material model 147 characterizing with the shear test, which is shown here in the bottom left. And you can see characterization um, model for this, uh, for this experiment in LS9. This is the typical behavior, this is theoretical, this is the experimental behavior of the shearing soil, soft soil. Now, again, you know, I know that the report tell, tells us that it uh, crashed, but we don't know what is the angle of crash. We know what is velocity, 80 meters per second, but we don't know what is the uh, angle. So we assume 30 and 10 degrees to see what happens in a regular configuration and upside down configuration. Well, of course, if you do 30 degrees, the vertical velocity is about 40 meters per second, and there's no way that you can get this type of um, uh, in, uh, vertical velocity knowing that the plane was falling from 30, 40 meters. But that's okay, you know, we can assume anything, again, to be on the conservative uh, uh, side. So you can see the uh, craters produce, uh, this is uh, with the wheels down, this is with the wheels up. No matter what you do, you will see, you should see the deep craters, visible craters. Even, of, of course, on, for the 10 degrees, which is the vertical velocity only 14 meters per second, you should see craters. Now, there are no craters in small lines. So if there are no craters in small, in small lines, it means that the, some, the plane had to disintegrate it. The mass had to be partitioned to small pieces uh, before it hit the ground. And indeed, this, this airplane uh, dispersed itself over to a large area, and pieces that you can find are as small as hand. Professor Szuladzinski, who is uh, expert in, in explosive from Australia, he claims that the higher energy explosive you put inside of the container, the smaller the fragments you will get after explosion. So he claims that the size of those parts are measure of the energy that was involved in the uh, explosion. Because in the airplane, a lot of things can explode. You know, for example, the uh, fuel can explode. Okay, it happened in, in some of the uh, American airplane. It was a wiring problem, and the uh, the, the gases in the uh, uh, wings exploded and downed uh, the airplane. Now, Dr. Szladzinski claims that the energy involved with the explosion of the fuel will not be sufficient to produce small uh, parts or small fragments uh, that are shown here. Um, let's look into the damage of the airplane. This is, no matter how you, um, uh, what is the angle of, of, of uh, hitting the ground, the, most of the damage is in the front part of the, of the airplane. It basically disintegrates into three pieces. The uh, interesting, the, uh, there was an exper experiment done with identical airplane, Boeing 727 by, uh, uh, done in, and shown in Discovery Channel uh, a month ago. You can see this experiment here. This is no pilots, no people over there. This is only instrumentation. So don't worry about uh, the crash. Here it is. Interestingly, that was done, this experiment was done after my simulation and uh, disintegrated the same way as my simulation. Power to the computing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this experiment costs a lot of money, you know, millions, okay, millions. They, they work on this experiment for years. But it is very useful. 
is very useful because first of all it confirms that my model is reasonable. The second of all, can co I can compare the accelerations. Of course, if you are a pilot of this plane, you are dead. Okay, that's that's unfortunate. And maybe if you are business uh, a class passenger, you may be dead as well. <laughs> but if you are uh, flying in the middle section and aft section of this uh, airplane, the measured accelerations were such that in the middle section you would maybe uh, lose uh, conscious and maybe you will have some broken ribs. Uh, in the aft part you can just stand up and run away. Even, <laughs> even, even the engines of this airplane were still operational after that crash. And the engines are designed to stop running at 6G uh, acceleration. So we can say that the, the acceleration in the aft part was below 6G. Well, if we do it, uh, uh, now our simulation with the uh, plane upside down and compare with the regular one, which we have experiment, and of course nobody did it yet, this particular experiment, and, and maybe we can write proposal to do it, but that would be... <laughs> <laughs> I cannot fly this airplane. But anyway, the, the, the accelerations the accelerations are smaller when the plane hits the ground at 30, 10 degrees upside down, which was surprised to me, than if it would fly into the ground with the wheels down. We had uh, apparently in the history, 4% of all crashes of the airplanes are upside down. So this is not very rare that the plane crashes upside down, 4%. Uh, this particular one was in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tupolev also, 134, and uh, uh, everybody survived, there was no, no uh, explosion, uh, 31 people were injured. This is the same airplane that crashed into the forest, wiped out hundreds of trees, not just one, hundreds of trees. By the way, the wings were in quite in good shape after cutting through uh, all these trees. The no explosion. Uh, everybody survived. 83 people injured. I understand that later on two people died in the hospital. But uh, uh, the airplane indeed uh, separated into several big chunks. Okay, big chunks. Well, what happened to this Tupolev with the president and everybody else, you can see here. This is a mess. This is completely a mess. There is a, a several large pieces, but not as large as, as you can see the intact fuselage. Uh, everything, all seats, everything was wiped out from the fuselage and there was nothing inside. The millions of small elements were dispersed on a huge area, like a rain dropped. So these are my final conclusions. Separation of one third of the wing, of the left wing, could not be caused by the impact with the birch tree. Most probably, a separation of a fragment of the wing was caused by explosion in the air. Okay, that could explain but definitely uh, the impact between the wing and the birch cannot explain separation at all. Open walls outside of the fuselage indicate mid-air explosion in the fuselage. The unpresented degree of damage and the large number of shrapnels indicate high energy mid-air explosion. Lack of visible crater at the crash scene indicate that the airplane disintegrated in the mid-air. Without a mid-air explosion, the most, most of the passengers in the center and the aft part of the airplane would survive if the plane indeed crashed from 30, 40 meters into the soft soil as an intact body. In the Russian report, they indicated that all, all passengers died because of 100 G acceleration. I cannot get 100 Gs, no matter how I crash, even with higher velocities into the ground. And in my opinion, that 100 G, it is possible to get through explosion in the fuselage, shock wave produced by explosion, 
and by possible direct impact of the passenger with the ground at 80 meters per second without any protection of the fuselage. Because once you open everything, that wind will, 80 meters per second, will just blow you out completely. So uh, that could be potential explanation. Thank you. Upside down on the ground, and I'm not sure if I'm 
attendance of record. Um, oh. Yeah, it was, it was well, maybe 10 slides back. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. No, I think I'm the, the one that I, let me see. This one, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's the bottom of the huge one. That's right? um, So does that suggest that indeed the plane did crash upside down, or? That, that, that suggests that that part of the airplane crashed upside down. Okay. Uh, there are other parts of the same fuselage that are uh, crashed regularly. Okay. okay. So that, that's also a problem. Uh, we didn't know, but what how to explain that, that some parts of the fuselage are wheels down, some parts of it are wheels up. Okay. Is it possible to do a simulation by and see what happens, or is this just uh... Theoretically, yes, but I can tell you it's very, very there is an equation that correlates the number of, uh, simul of simulations with the number of PhD students. <laughs> <laughs> there are some constraints there. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you have mentioned uh, fuel in the books, and I actually had this question coming to your talk. So, has anybody considered that the explosion could have been triggered by the impact on whatever object, and uh, that this could cause the explosion of fuel vapors? So far, so-called official uh, reports did not consider any explosion at all. Uh, the, the official reports, which are in, uh, the, the institutions that were IKO uh, blessed, uh, they said that it was a verge. So, in, in my opinion, in the, my results, I don't even need to do anything more. And uh, just the fact that the verge I have proven without any doubt, because again, you know, my tree is four times stronger than any birch dry birch, which is five, maybe 20 percent you know, of the strength of the birch of the layer. But the, 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 the call is to IKO and, and other organizations, world organizations, to investigate this, because this is important for all of us. We are flying airplanes. If, we, uh, if there was, like you said, the uh, explosion because of the fuel, and we did not know why, it may happen again, and we may die if that happen in the future airplane. Okay? So I think that the, 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 whatever happened should be investigated, and this is by law again, that AKO requires the, the, the committee to investigate uh, uh, to, to get the right answer. Okay? I, I have one problem with this question because uh, on the level this plane was six meters cut, there would be not enough power or whatever explosion it was that couldn't turn and twist the plane around. That's yeah. the simple answer. Yeah, yeah. So you know we have to fly up, right, to bring that turn. Uh, I, I don't. If, if, if my logic would be, if the, there was explosion, it should be at the impact. Okay, with the dash team, let's say, not. Uh, 10 seconds later, okay. But uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying this needs to be investigated. I'm not saying one way or the other. Yes, one more question. Uh, <coughs> this is the pivotal issue in this whole thing. It drags a lot of politics into it and so on, which I, I'd like to avoid that. But if the wing broke up and the plane on that broken remaining stuff that we need. So the plane would have to, for a short period of time, drag that wing along the soil, very soft soil. I might be fine at first. There's no such thing. Several feet deep. Yeah, there's no such stuff. However long it is. There's no such stuff. Because that is the official version. The plane flipped along that wing. This is that wing caused the yeah. moment to... Uh, Theoretically, you would be absolutely right, but there should be evidence on the ground. There's no such evidence. And this is why both uh, this black curve, which is measured by TAFs, and even this investigated community Russia, makes the airplane 40 meters. So you cannot touch the ground. You cannot touch any vegetation on the ground when it is rotating. Okay. They wanted it because there was no sign. You can, there were, after the crash, there was hundreds, hundreds of 
photo reporters, and they took so many pictures. They are all on the internet. You can almost look and investigate the whole area from the birch tree and below, before the birch tree, to the crash site. Okay. So that, that, that you cannot erase it. Okay. What what Russia did it. In fact, there was a vertical, uh, or, or excuse me, one of the things they that in one of the uh, the day after the, the, the photograph of, from satellite, it shows this piece in one location. Next day, in different location. So for for and for some reason, they started to gather the parts together. And then in the report, you can say, well, yeah, we, 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 we know it was there, but we moved because we didn't want anybody to steal this piece. But in, in the report, we put it in the right location, which was uh, documented by American satellite picture. No, the, the new location is the official location. And when, when we asked, wait, wait a second, there's a second picture. They, there's no answer. They basically ignored the question. There's about 150 or more right, questions that were ignored that were officially put by the public government and they were never answered. Sir, thank you very much. This is uh, very important work. Um, as a former aircraft engineer and a former pilot, I cannot emphasize how important it is to understand the reasons for the crash and using science to find those reasons so that we all feel safer when we fly next time. It's really so this is not political, this is just technology. Thank you very much. This is my